Welcome back to Venshon Denshon, my YouTube channel. And today it is such an immense pleasure for me to welcome Tony Plog. How are we going to describe Tony? Are we going to call him a teacher, a conductor, a composer, a trumpet player, an all-time amazing person? I think that's a pretty good start. Tony, welcome to the channel. Ex-trumpet player, ex-trumpet player, but thank you so much. Player. Yeah, yeah. So I have a question that I ask people often at the start. And for you, the question is going to need to open up a little bit. The question I ask is, if you think back over your career, some memorable concerts that you played in, but I guess for you, and it might be hard because I guess all of your pieces will be like children that you love equally, but maybe some memorable concerts you played, but also some memorable performances of your own works. Oh, okay. Um, okay, I can think of two of each category. Is that okay? Beautiful. Okay, so in terms of playing, one was pathetic and one was, uh, at least for me, profound and moving. <laughs> um, and I don't know if you, you can edit out the pathetic thing if, if you're going to edit this. Um, it was the first time I ever played. I was in fifth grade. I was 10 years old. And I had been playing trumpet for... I'm not sure, maybe three to six months. And my father was my teacher. My father taught, I think, 500 to 600 beginning students. So he was my first teacher. And it was for a talent show at our elementary, or at our, our what do you call it now? It's not junior high school, but um, elementary school. And um, it was the first time I'd ever played in front of an audience. And my dad had written out, actually, probably about 300 songs. And they were in a spiral notebook. And I was at the stage where I could read up to maybe quarter notes. And so it was a very simple song with piano. And my dad told me to memorize it. And of course I was too lazy to memorize it. So when I got on stage and it was in a school cafeteria, I'd never been in front of 300 people before. And so I got incredibly nervous, so nervous that my knees were literally, legs were shaking. And um, I started to play and there was, there was an open door on the side of the cafeteria and there was a draft that blew in and it caused the pages of this spiral bound to fly by. And I was so panicked and so nervous. I just played whatever flew by and um, children in the auditorium were laughing. So that was, <laughs> that was, I guess you could say a memorable concert. Um, and then um, years later, after I became a professional player, um, I was in, in Europe. That's when I substituted for Ed Tarr when we did a teaching exchange. And I did a tour with Helmut Rilling and his uh, choir from Stuttgart. And um, the main piece that we did on this tour was the Bach B minor mass. And I was actually, um, there are three Leuben brothers um, awesome. that play together. And um, one of them could not make the tour. So I was like the second Leuben brother. And we played in Eastern Europe, that time Eastern Europe, that's before the wall uh, fell. And we had two concerts in Poland, uh, in Krakow and then in Warsaw. And the, I'll try and make this as quick as I can, but they're really moving experiences for me. When we played in Krakow, as soon as we got into Poland, everything was, was um, dreary and gray and dark. The sky looked gray. Uh, everybody seemed depressed. It was a very depressing experience. It's a lot different now. Um, and we did this concert and there's a young woman 25 years old, maybe 30, in the front row, who on all of the choruses was singing along with the orchestra. And I've never seen somebody radiate such joy in music. And we played the first half, and, and I think a number of people in the orchestra could see her. And the second half, um, as we came out, we started playing. I started watching her in the choruses, and her the light had gone out of her eyes. She sat there expressionless. And at the end, when we took our bows, um, some people were booing because they they we were representative of Western society, not communist society. And she, after maybe 30 seconds to a minute, she ended up putting her head in her hands and started weeping. Um, and everybody in, in, in the orchestra was that saw her was really touched by that. And obviously somebody from the Communist Party had gotten to her during intermission and said, you can't do that. You can't express yourself that way. And the next night we played or afternoon, we played in the, I think the biggest church in Warsaw. And that was the church, I think it was 1984, where the cardinal of that church had been murdered. They found his body in a, in a river. And so that concert of the B minor mass 
and there was no break. We played the entire B minor mass straight through. That concert was really thought of as being like a mass for this murdered cardinal. And there was no applause. And we find, finished the final chord. And as we got up to leave, we walked past people who were standing in the church. And they were standing erect, very proud, um, no emotion in their face in a way, except you could just see tears streaming down their face. And so those two days in a row, that was really moving to me. And it really showed what music could do and the profound effect of music. Wow. Well, I can tell you, I oh, certainly will that's, not. That's be, a contrast, isn't it? <laughs> I will not be editing People laughing that out, at me. Tony. They're fantastic <laughs> stories. And they're, I guess they're united in that they both have strong emotions involved. And that, wow, that you were part of that's That's quite, that's amazing. And that is something that I guess we talk about a lot, but to really experience that power of music and the, the, in I'm going to say a real situation. I mean, these people, they were, you know, they were living something that I couldn't imagine. And I actually yes. found that when I lived in Europe, that Eastern Europeans often had trouble taking me seriously as a person, because they would kind Ooh. of think, well, you know, you grew up in Australia, what do you really know about things? And uh -huh. in a certain level, I kind of have to agree that people that have experienced life events or life situations and we're veering away away from the normal topic but i think that's great that mm -hmm. it's i can i can understand why that would have that would have touched you so much especially that that first night and then the second night together just the power of that and be minor mass is of course an amazing work in any case in any yeah. situation yeah. wow we had actually, after the final concert, a number of the people in the orchestra, it might have been, you know, you always have, after big concerts, you'll have a, a party in a hotel room or something like that. And we got together and, and we collected money to give to, there was one person, I think, who represented Solidarity, who had been in contact. I forget that. And, and we gave money. And I remember that, you know, people were giving, in those days, German marks because it was not the euro yet euro and um i had 11 i had been living in europe but i had 11 us dollars in my pocket in my wallet and um which actually was a considerable amount of money over there you know in in eastern europe and so i i gave all my 11 dollars for that and i was really proud doing that because i thought i was hoping that whoever saw that would know that there was an american in there that was supporting their cause too so that was very the whole the whole tour was an incredible tour. I actually wrote a long um, article about it. I kept a journal about it, and it's on, on my website actually. Well, um, I'm gonna I would, your website. Orchestra. I'm gonna be um, linking your website in the in the comments for this um, in the in the liner notes. Hey, what do you call liner notes? What do you call it in the description of this video? Because I've been having a look at it. It's a treasure trove. Your website oh. has so much amazing stuff. Blog posts which I'm going to, I guess we call them blog posts, which we're, I'm going to, um, you know, okay. I'm going to be linking. So I do want to, I'm going to persist and come back to my other question about your own performances of your own works, maybe mm -hmm. one or two of those, because you said you had two of them and I want to probe what they were. I'm interested. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd say the first was uh, the, uh, the trumpet concerto I wrote, the second trumpet concerto, which is trumpet and orchestra. And it's a really big piece. It's maybe 27, 28 minutes long. And I wrote it for Nick Norton, who's an extremely close friend of mine. He's just a wonderful person. His wife's fantastic. Claudia's fantastic as well. And, and he did the premiere. And it's interesting, at least for me, the way I consider my works is I think some of my best works have only been performed once or twice or never. Um, and and some of my other works that I think are okay, um, nobody gets hurt, hopefully, but they get performed a lot. And this was a piece or is a piece that hasn't gotten performed much. But when Nick performed it with the Utah Symphony, gave the premiere, he did a, a just a fantastic job. And the orchestra played great. Richard Buckley was a conductor, did a great job. So that was really moving. And then um, there's a, another opera that I've written. It's not, not really been performed in its entirety. Um, called Spirits. And the story, it's about two and a half hours long, the entire opera. And the story is a, a Holocaust story. It does not take place in Germany, but it's just a, a it could take place anywhere, anytime. Um, and it's about four people. 
and they sort of show the different sides of this. And basically, I wanted to tell a Holocaust story from the side of the victimizer rather than the, the victim. Having read um, numerous books on the psychology of the Holocaust and all of that. And so I had talked to Kim Carballo, who's um, a, an accompanist at Indiana University, but she has also started a thing called ROK, Reimagining Opera for Kids. And um, I had talked to her actually about doing Aesop's Fables because I had done some very short operas on Aesop's Fables. But she saw this opera on her website and she said, I want to do that. And I said, well, I don't think you want to do this for kids. And she does it for age uh, grades one through six and then seven through 12, because several people are killed in the opera and it's an incredibly dark theme. And it has, the opera is basically about moral choices that, that we make. And she said, no, I think in this day and age, um, that's what we need to be discussing. So they did, um, they've done several performances of a very cut down version um, of about 40 minutes and quite often only for like two string players and piano and then a, a few singers. And they did this once at a Holocaust, um, I think it's called like Memorial Week or whatever, I believe in February at a church. And afterwards they had a discussion with a rabbi, a priest and a historian about the opera. And that for me, that even though I was not there, I was in Germany, uh, that was like a highlight of my life as a composer. Just to think that I had, I had written this that was taken so seriously and considered so seriously by these three, you know, wonderful, great people. So. Wow. How do, how do the kids receive it when they, when, when it's performed? Have you had any feedback? You know, actually, I, that's a really good question. I was not there when it was performed for the young kids. This was performed for an, uh, you know, an adult audience. Okay. And, yeah, people in the audience though said they were, they were quite moved uh, by it. And, and um, because it really goes into the psychology and how people can commit um, these heinous acts. And, and a lot of it was based on a book and and given to my me by a good friend Mike Burrell and the opera is dedicated to him called Into That Darkness uh, by Gita Sereny, uh, which was about um, oh Franz uh, I just forgot his last name that's terrible but he was the commandant at Treblinka and he was actually not not a, a bad guy like you'd think of Joseph Mengele he just ran, ran the camp but the way he got there was because he just kept he wanted power and he just kept making one bad decision after another that based on weakness, basically, I think that led him to a position where he felt like he couldn't get out. And, and at the end of this book, she did this interview with him that lasted a long time. And finally, at the end, several times she'd said, do you feel any responsibility for what happened? And he said, no. And she knew that she had to ask him to, in the last interview, that question again, they both knew it. She asked him that question again. And he said, yes, I do, because I outlived other people. 19 hours later, he died of a heart attack. So, I mean, it's an incredible book. And, and a lot of the opera is based on that and, and a number of other books about the Holocaust. So. These, you know, you're touching on questions that I've often asked myself as well, that, I don't, I don't believe that there are intrinsically bad people and good people. I think that, you know, I think that it's really, I find it, it's really difficult to understand how things happen. And I guess things happen in increments, in small increments, and you can end up somewhere where you would never have imagined. I think so. One of the other books that was a key book for me um, was, is by a psychologist uh, by the name of Robert Lifton called Nazi doctors. <clears throat> and he comes up with, with this concept called doubling, which is similar to schizophrenia, but a little bit different. And that's, uh, you can have benign doubling or let's say evil dub doubling and benign doubling. Suppose like you're studying to be a doctor and the first time you go in to dissect the cadaver, you faint because, because you, you're not used to it, you, you can't take it. Three or four months later, you're doing that work and you're talking to somebody about what are you going to have for lunch today or would you like to join me for lunch? So that's doubling that you almost switch into a different personality. And people, when they got to Auschwitz, Nazi doctors, and keep, the interesting thing is the people that did the selections in Auschwitz were doctors and doctors take, take the Hippocratic Oath. So 
either they had to start doubling before or they had to double within an hour or two of when they got to Auschwitz or they basically couldn't survive it. And they felt a, a lot of doctors, and maybe this was an excuse, but they felt as though if they didn't start to double, they could be executed themselves. Now there's a lot of controversy about that point, but anyway. Wow. That, that was the that was the opera that I wrote that I thought was really a great performance. Amazing. Amazing. We're gonna do a massive, I call it a pivot now. We're gonna to pivot to a, an age that we have in common that in that when I first met you, or well, first of all, I met you and I didn't get to meet you. And we're going to tell that story of how I didn't meet you and then how I did meet you because of what happened to you at the airport. I think that's a story oh. that needs to be told. <laughs> and then okay. I, want to, I want to just do a bit of a parallel of you at 18 or 19 and me, because when we met, I was, all, I was 19 as well. So first of all, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell a bit of a story. I was studying at the Sydney Conservatorium and we were told... Tony Plogg was coming to give us some lessons and some masterclasses. And the head of brass, Ken Smith, went off to the airport to meet Tony. And he came back without Tony. So what happened there? Why, why didn't we get to see you that first time? Well, okay, so here's the, it was a, I spent 32 hours on airplanes that weekend. Um, I was actually doing something in, in Nashville and I flew Nashville to Phoenix, Phoenix to Los Angeles International. I had three hours before I caught a flight to Australia. What nobody told me was that I needed, um, oh, not a passport, what do you call it? Visa. Um, visa, yeah, I needed a visa. And you can't get into the country without a visa. And the person that was, that was giving me my ticket to get on the plane was talking to somebody and he stamped my ticket visa requirement checked. And so I got on the plane without a visa, but they let, let me on the plane because the, the guy had, you know, made a mistake. And so I got to Australia and they said, you need a visa. And how much money do you have? And I think I only had $19 because I was going to change um, some money over there. I think that was it. And the woman there was really awful to me. And so I had to wait for seven hours in the airport. I couldn't, I, I tried to, I called my agent. I got one call. So I called my agent um, and she wasn't able to to help out and um, I couldn't talk to Ken Smith I couldn't talk to anybody and they made me sit there for seven hours and then there were, with a policeman on either side of me two policemen walked me back to the plane to fly back to Los Angeles um, and so that was the story of, of what happened and I finally was able to get um, I think it was Qantas Airlines to uh, give me a free ticket then the next year to come to Australia um, because I made a lot of threats and everything. Was it the year after? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, it would have been. That's right. And so when you did eventually come to Australia, when you came to Sydney, that was the first time we met. And I just remember, I, I think I played Tomasi or Hinder, but probably Tomasi. And I had a lesson. I just remember you being the most positive and encouraging teacher. And for me, that remained a really a strong positive experience for me at that at that time and, and you you know you talked to me about things in the states and it was just a you know it was a really it was a really a happy a happy stay when you came what was it like for you when you came out and was teaching you were teaching us I guess you must have played a recital as well or something what was what was that experience yeah. like for you I did four recitals there I was in four different wow. um cities so I did four different recitals um one thing I remember very vividly was until just about the end, I, I was awake every morning from 2.30 in the morning on. I mean, I was just killed by jet lag. I also remember there was a, there's a swimming pool. I was really into doing um, like marathons or triathlons at that time. And there was a swimming pool about a, an, uh, um, let's say about a 10 minute run, I think, from where I was staying on the, was it the biological gardens? I think you'd call Botanical it. Botanical gardens. Like, Botanical gardens. Okay. You were probably staying in the flat at the con because there was a flat yeah. upstairs. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It was upstairs. And I, I remember swimming in this pool and it was unbelievably cold. Most of the people had wetsuits on. I was cold for the rest of the day. But what I remember about your lesson, it's, it's pretty vague in my mind, but I just remember that you played so well and you were so um, intelligent in the way that you approach music. I'm not sure if I told you this specifically, but I certainly was thinking it that, you know, basically I can't, I, I can't help you with, with playing, but what can I do to help your career or whatever? I mean, I, I don't remember specifics. You probably remember specifics because that's the way it works. When you have the lesson, when you're the student, you remember more than the teacher does. 
Um, but yeah, so. And so then I was about 19 and I was getting these kinds of opportunities. I was playing quite a bit in the Sydney Symphony. And then I went on to, um, you know, to go to Europe and make my career there. When you, I was just reading on your website, when you were 19, you were playing as a, as a sub in the LA Phil. So what was that like? Mm -hmm. uh, it was great. It was fantastic. It was, it was sort of terrifying uh, because I was playing with my teachers who were, were heroes. Um, and of course, when I would get called for something to play extra, it would be a big piece, a Mahler symphony or the Rite of Spring or Ein Heldenleben or, or whatever. And so sitting next, I mean, that's something I'll always treasure, you know, sitting next to, to my teachers and, and watching them play, watching them perform under pressure, playing under people like Zubin Mehta, Claudio Obato conducted Mahler 6 one time, which was fantastic. Um, yeah, it was just a great experience really great experience and when you say your teachers you, you mean tom stevens tom stevens my first my father was my first teacher yep and one of his students was irving bush who played okay. in the l.a philharmonic and so um after a while my my dad transferred me to irving and so i studied with irving maybe for six or seven years and irving was just fantastic and especially for the basics and we were always close family friends because when irving was a kid he played my brother's dance band and and my father was almost like a father to Irving. And so we've always had a close family relationship and, and Irving has passed on now, but I'm still in touch with his wife, uh, Marilyn. Um, and so Irving was really great. And one thing he did when I was about maybe 18 or 19, is he said, there's this new trumpet player. We have a new third trump third trumpet player in the orchestra. Um, who just came in, played with a Dallas Symphony, and um, you've been with me a long time, and I want you to stop taking from me and start taking from him. And I was, at the time, I didn't say it, but I was sort of hurt because I thought, well, maybe he wasn't happy with the way I was progressing or something like that, but he knew it was time for me to move on. And it turned out this new third trumpet player was Tom Stevens. Um, wow. And so Irving transferred me to Tom, and, and Tom was great. You know, Basically, I sort of took from Tom only one summer um but that was just incredibly important for me studying with tom as well and so sitting next to them and also i studied with bob duvall robert duvall who was the principal trumpet in the orchestra at ucla and um i is in terms of learning th things on a trumpet that wasn't so great because there were two other people in the one hour class and the other two hadn't practiced so he had to spend most of his time with, with them but the type of person Bob Duvall was, the, the true gentleman that he was, and how humble and self-effacing he was, um, was, I still think of that a lot. I mean, he was just wonderful. So, and it was a very interesting section because Bob Duvall and Irving Bush were really old school gentlemen, um, great integrity that, that they always wore a tie to rehearsals. And then you had Tom Stevens and Mario Guarneri, who were the, you know, the young kids in town that, that would, you know, probably wear jeans and maybe a t-shirt or something like that. So it's a really interesting section, but it was a great, great section. Oh yeah. I, I used to have, I used to have quite a few of those studio recordings with Mater. I think I had the Rite of Spring and I had a few others that were, mm -hmm. they had that, they, they were kind of dry because they were done in a studio. The, the sound, but they oh, were, okay. uh -huh. was, you know, amazing playing. So yeah. were you already composing then? Had you already, were you already writing music from when you were, when you were younger or did that come later on? Well, sort of both. I wrote a piece when I was in college, my last year in college, I played in the brass quintet. So I wrote a piece for the brass quintet called mini suite, which was actually published um, by Western international music. And, um, it was a four movement work that was not even four minutes long. So I lacked something in terms of development, but having a piece published was, was really great. So I'd say about every year or two, I would write a, a brass piece, but it wasn't until about 1980, maybe, you know, when I was started late twenties, I guess that I started to get a little bit more interested in, in composition, but it was still brass. And then I actually had this experience in December of 89. I was in Berlin to play a couple of Christmas oratorios and also um, uh, a couple of solos with organ 
solo conscious with Oregon. And I had a free night and I was staying with some people who put me up. They lived right across the street from the Deutsche Oper. And so I went to hear the Prokofiev ballet that they were doing that night, Romeo and Juliet, which is one of my all time favorite pieces. And with the death of Tybalt, which ended, I think the second act, um, I remember my hand just, just flying up to my mouth and, and on the program notes, I still had the program note, you know, where it's, I, I have to be a composer. And even if I fail as a composer, I can say my profession is the same as, as Prokofiev. And, and that was like really a transformative moment for me. Wow, it's interesting because that you've you've answered my next question because I want I was wondering at what Sorry. point no no because I was wondering at what point you you made that decision and I think being a composer like that and it's, I'm drawing a parallel. Hawkan also had his "I'm going to be a soloist" moment in Berlin as well. He was playing the first yeah. time he played with the it was just after Munich and he got a gig playing. He was playing a concerto and he had that same feeling that you're describing this is what I have to do that vocation yeah. and what's interesting is for me is when I was teaching trumpet in Basel one of the first things I used to make my students read was Briefe an einen jungen Dichter Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke and there's a passage mm. there where the poet kind of where, where Rilke is saying so you've sent me these poems and you're asking me whether I think they're any good whether you think you should be a poet or not and he says what you need to do is go into the stillness of yourself and ask yourself do I have to write is it mm -hmm. a need is it a deep not just a desire do I have to do it and if the answer is yes then do it go for a hundred percent if the answer is yeah. no then do something else do it as a hobby and I used to kind of have that for my students that were wanting to be professional trumpet players to ask themselves that question. And it sounds like a lot of people, even without someone telling them externally, they have that moment. And for you, it was hearing Prokofiev, Romeo and Juliet, that moment of thinking, this is what I have to do. And then I guess you map out, you, you, you do what needs to happen. I mean, you kept playing trumpet. You were still, you played in Basel and you were still playing after that, weren't you? But I guess you had the idea yeah. that composition was going to be your thing. Yeah, it took about 11 years before I was able to, to retire from the trumpet because um, I got married and and um, we had two children. And of course, you have to <laughs> you have to make money. Um, in fact, when I played in Basel, there was one night where Kelsey, my daughter, is is now uh, 27 and I'm a grandfather. She has a, a, a beautiful, almost 10 month old baby boy, but she was maybe, I don't know, six at the time or seven or something like that. And I had to go to Basel for a, a concert and she, she said, she started crying, you know, because I had to leave her maybe not crying, but, you know, getting really teary. And I said, Kelsey, you know why I have to go to Basel? And she said, I know, cause we're broke. So, uh, <laughs> That's that's sort of uh, you know I had to keep playing. I, I still love playing, of course, and, and playing in Basel was was great. Uh, it was a great experience playing in that hall and under those conductors and with the, the brass section. But um, yeah, I mean, I was definitely pointed towards being a composer. Wow! When you were playing in Basel, was that before the fusion when it was still the radio and the symphony, or had they already combined by then? I actually played in three different orchestras. So I played in the Basel, the first orchestra um, that was not the radio orchestra. Right. And then, and then, the, and then my, I, and I think it was just going to be for a year. And I, and I did that. I came at the, like at last minute to, I got a call and this was after Kelsey had been born and I had not been practicing as much because, you know, being a father and teaching and all of that. And I got a call from Basel asking if I could come and record the Dvorak New World Symphony the next morning and play the concert in the evening. And, and I said, could you call back in 10 minutes and let me go down in the basement and see if I can... <laughs> if I can hit the high B and, and everything. And so, so I went, I went to the basement and, and I could get the high B and, and uh, I said, okay, you know, let's try it. And so th that went okay. And so they asked me to play a season when the season was over. That was, I think the, if I remember correctly, that was the end of my time, but then the radio symphony, um, Nicholas Eklund was, I think he went back to Sweden. He had been playing with, with the orchestra. He went back to Sweden. And so they knew that I had been in Basel. So they asked me to play that. 
that year and then the two orchestras combined for the third year and I played the third year so I actually played in a way in three different orchestras in Basel yeah wow well yeah I have a lot of close connections with those Basel players as well that's 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 I can, I can really see you see you know um, da, 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 dee, oh yep okay we can do it let's go <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you know it's, and I think you interviewed Mark Ulrich I'll tell you. I'm done, Mark. Yeah, because Mark's so busy being a grandfather. But Mark, si oh, tu vois ça, terrific for Mark, him. si tu vois ça, je veux faire ton interview. I just say, Mark, if he sees this, because he's 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 a new grandfather as well. I can't get it, Mark. I want to do your interview. Okay. Okay. Well, I hope he doesn't get mad at me for telling this story. But Mark is such an, a natural player, and the first the first thing we had to do with the Basel Radio Orchestra at the beginning of the season was that we were recording, I think it was Mio Symphony and the conductor's name, I think was Alan Francis. I remember he had broken his left arm. So he had his left arm in a cast and was conducting. Very nice guy. And we played, played about an hour and Mark got there like five minutes before the, the recording session started, you know, played a few notes and then we started playing. And I thought he played great, you know, but he might've missed a note or two or it didn't feel right or something. And he said, he raised his hand after about an hour and said, could we take a, a break right now? Because, um, you know, I just got here really late and, and, you know, and conductor said, sure, fine. So we take a break. Mark goes and for the entire 15 minutes, he's just drinking an espresso or two with friends. Didn't play a note, came back, played the rest of the session perfectly. So I could never do that. I never had that kind of talent. Yeah. I mean, I, Mark is not the sort of person you want to compare yourself to. I never did when I played in a quintet with him and when I learned from him. Uh -huh. Mark was Mark was another level of of yeah, of trumpet. I'm I'm gonna yeah. say of trumpet genius. Mark Mark was, yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark was amazing. Um yeah. it's talking about Mark, it does bring me to a someone we all knew well that I couldn't forgive myself if I had you in this interview and you didn't share some of your reflections of Ed. Because oh, I know that okay. you knew Ed well. I was Ed, I mean, I guess we knew slightly different generations of Ed because I studied with Ed in 1990. But if you were already replaced, you were doing a swap with him in the 80s, you must have known Ed earlier. So can you talk a little bit about your relationship with our beloved Edward H. Tarr? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, happily. Um, well, when I was growing up, the two main soloists that we knew of in the United States were Maurice Andre and Ed Tarr. So I had records of, of each of them. And of course, when you're a young player growing up, you have your trumpet heroes, you know, so they were trumpet heroes of mine. And finally, when I was older and I got my first teaching job at Cal State Northridge, I knew I heard somehow I heard that Ed was going to be in Los Angeles, I think, with his brass ensemble. And um and so I invited him to do a master class. So he came and did a master class, and that's how he, we met. And as a result of that, I suggested writing a piece for his brass ensemble, uh, which would use the formation of Gabrielli, but in a modern context, which ended up being called Music for Brass Octet, very original title. Um, and, and so they did the, the premiere over in in Europe and I came over for the premiere. And so that's sort of how we, how we met, spent time with him then. And, and so we just knew each other um, through the years that way. I mean, he was, he always knew a lot more than I did, <laughs> especially about uh, Baroque music, you know, and he had a, he had a very interesting way of, of playing. He was maybe not, he was not the caliber of a Maurice Andre or something in terms of playing, but he had he had this intellectual side. He really knew all of the, the historical precedents for what he was doing, but yet he really played with a tremendous amount of warmth in, in the way he, he did things. And um, actually, I remember one concert we did with Baroque trumpets at the Scola. Um, and I think I I think we did a couple of duets. And actually, I remember we recorded some duets for, for a recording. And there's a picture of us where I had to stand on a podium so that our bells would be <laughs> the same level. Because Ed's, what, about, he was about 6'3", I think. He was tall. And I'm not 6'3", yeah. Um, but at the end, it, it, it ended on a C major chord. And, and he and on this last chord, just the C in the middle of the staff, he went, ba -ra -ba 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 -ba. And, and afterwards, I said, was that, wow, I, I'd never heard that before. Is that a, a standard like ornament? And he said, no, nah, I just felt like it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was such a great answer, you know? Um, I think some of the times that's missing. Uh, some of the times that just 
let it be sort of uh, mentality. Um, but yeah, we, we worked together. And of course, we did this teaching exchange. And the reason why he wanted to do the teaching exchange was that he wanted to be in California in the winter. And so I was in Basel, and it was the fourth coldest winter of that um, century when I was there. And I remember calling him one February and I was inside, but my feet were still cold because it was so cold outside. And I said, Ed, how are you doing? And the first thing he said was, oh, I'm doing great. I'm on the balcony here in shorts and a t-shirt having a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, so that's the reason why he did it. And he actually told um, Peter Reitermeister, who was the, the uh, I guess you'd say, what, not the dean, no, the, the director. director. The director. Yeah, director. Yeah, at the at the school of Kentorum, that I that I was an expert um, baroque trumpet player, and at at that time I didn't even own a baroque trumpet, you know. So he said, "I'm going to bring one over for, for Christmas. We're I'm visiting LA for Christmas. I'll bring one from Agar, and you'd better learn it." Um, so I ended up reading a lot of books and and you know practicing hard on the baroque trumpet, um, and so you know we had that that thing too. And I also played in a number of. Um, I think D minor masses and Christmas oratorios and things like that with where Ed played first and Boo Nielsen played second. Oh, wow, nice. I, I played third. And in those days, um, his, the trumpet ensemble would be listed on the program. Um, and he was like a rock star then. I mean, he was absolutely like a rock star. When I was playing, you know, there's just this kid from the United States playing third trumpet. I remember a couple of people in the course coming up and asking for my autograph as the third trumpet player. That would never, even for the first trumpet player in the United States, would would never happen. So, um, yeah, I mean, he was definitely a rock star in his day. I think because Ed's career took place mostly before the digital age, I mean, there are certainly some CDs and things. I think it's difficult for people of the younger generations to get a sense of what it was like. And you've, you've described it really well, because I went around and I did a few gigs with Ed as well. And there was... Mm -hmm. He was someone, he just, he had a presence about him, an aura, but also a wicked sense of humor. And one thing I always, I always remember that we'll be, we'd be playing something and he would just say, he would say, let's put this turkey in the oven. Or he just, just a little <laughs> comment like that, just before you're about to do a hard chorus yeah. or a hard entry or something. And he yeah, would, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so, yeah. And, but the other thing that is remarkable to me as well is you did the warmth, like Ed could play something not necessarily better than another trumpet player, but there was something more. And I think it was a combination, obviously, of the intellect, but also just, yeah, he, he could he could bring emotion into his playing. And that, yeah, that yeah. Was, that was really remarkable. And I, I, I've never told you this, but Ed always spoke very, very warmly about you to us and to really? me. Oh, yeah, of, of course, definitely. Wow. Well, we sure, we sure had um, some great times together. And playing with he and Boo. Oh, wow. Was just great. That was just great you know because boo could be incredibly funny too dry yeah. my experience of boo yeah, no, yeah. Was very dry i only met yeah. him a couple of times but he's it was he was dry and his humor could cut you like cut through like a knife but oh um, yeah sure yeah well got just one story i mean boo and i well, a couple of stories about boo I ended up playing in the, in the Malmö Symphony. Boo got me in the Malmö Symphony. And that's how I ended up in, in Europe. And we got married in Malmö and, and, and so oh. forth. Yeah. And the first the first um, concert that I played was Sibelius second. And so Boo was the regular second trumpet player in the orchestra. So I was playing first. And I had played Sibelius second a number of times in the United States. But Boo, it was like that week Boo gave me a lesson on how Scandinavians play Sibelius second, different phrasing ideas and all of that. And the solo in the second movement, ba -da 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 -de -da 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 -de -da. Um, you know, the first rehearsal I played it and I thought I played it fine. And Boo said, you need to put more emotion into it, you know, phrase more. And so I thought, okay. So, you know, I, I thought I put more emotion to it and, and phrase more. And he said, no, you need to, you need to do more, you know? So then I really went for it. And then he said, well, now you're in Las Vegas. <laughs> so, that was very very typical of boo yeah yeah definitely um it's it's really nice to it's really nice to share these stories and i think it's really one of my aims of this channel is to provide a place where young musicians and people that didn't get the chance to know ed and boo as well that they can just hear 
hear us talking about them and to yeah you know, to treasure their memories. But yeah. now I would like to, I'm going to remember another time. And I think this is actually the last time we saw each other in person was in Bern at the premiere of your triple concerto where Bill Williams, oh, okay. David Johnson mm -hmm. and Stanley Clark performed your triple concerto. And that was, I remember it was an outdoor, I think it was in the, in the, in the, in the big plots. So maybe talk a little bit about that work and let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about your career as a, as a composer. Okay, you know, the one thing I remember about that concert was the performance and then I was walking with Bill Williams to, we were gonna eat at a restaurant and he said, um, did you hear the news? And I said, no, he said, uh, Princess Diana died in a car crash. And that's what I remembered specifically about that concert. It's like, where were you when Elvis died or when Kennedy was shot, you know, or, or something like that. Um, yeah, so that's what I remember about that. Yeah, so, um, yeah, they did a great they did a great job with with that piece. Yeah, they did. It was fun being down there. And so, um, well, I, you know, I've got you here. What are you working on now? What What are you What are you Are you Are you composing anything at the moment, or what's the What's in the pipeline? Yeah, I'm always, I'm always composing something. Of course. Um, the big and, and I usually I'm I think I'm not similar to a lot of composers in that I work on several pieces at the same time. And so if I, if I, right now, I don't have a lot of time to compose because of, of uh, my grandson is here a lot. So I'm uh, uh, you know, like a professional babysitter and, and loving that. But um, I work on several pieces at the same time. And that way, if I get burned out on one piece or get blocked, I immediately move to another piece or I can engrave or whatever. So I don't have to worry so much about writer's block that at least that's the way it works for me. Um, so, the small piece that I've, I've finished is just a very small um, commission for, it's called the World Trumpet Society. They're having a, a, a competition coming up. So just about a three and a half minute piece for that, for solo trumpet. And then I'm writing a piece for um, Eddie Ludema, who um, does the tech on my podcast. Um, and it's for flugelhorn, it's a really strange combination, flugelhorn, bass, clarinet, and wind ensemble. Nice. And then... Yeah, and then the, the uh, well, we'll see, I hope. <laughs> I hope I can make it nice. And then uh, the big work that, that's gonna take a year or two is uh, a big opera about Caroline uh, Herschel, who was the first woman astronomer um, way back when. Her brother uh, discovered uh, Uranus uh, as wow. an example. And she was, she was very, very famous and lived this amazing life of first almost being like this Cinderella type figure and then ending up being, you know, very noted, highly noted. Is that a commission that you've got a performance for? Or? No, no. Actually, um, every opera that I've written is just, um, I'm, I'm very idealistic. In fact, Ron Kidd, who's, uh, who wrote the libretto for this, and we've done, he's, Ron and, and Nick are my two best friends. Ron has said, I'm the only person he knows that every career choice I make goes towards less money. Um, so, so this is, uh, this is like the other opposites written because I want to write it and hopefully, hopefully someday we'll find a performance. That's wonderful. Performances. I do want to ask you a bit of a, it's probably a, I don't know if it's a, a silly question, but do you, do you compose at the piano or do you compose at the computer? How do how does it go from being in your brain to being, do you, do you, do you use a, a, a pencil or are you composing digitally? How, what's the process like a little bit? Well, I used to almost always be at, 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 the, at the piano. Um, I think it was Shostakovich in his book said, anybody who needs a piano is an idiot, I think. But, uh, but that was me. Um, that book I've is apocryphal. Pieces. That book that you're talking about, <laughs> Testimony. I mean, te it's a great yeah. book. I, I, there was a, just a diversion. There was a time in my teens where I could open that book at any point and just continue reading because I'd read it dozens hundreds of times and then a few years later it turned out that maybe Solomon Volkov made it all up and it wasn't you know there was the it was casting the question but I love I used to love that book yeah you know actually an interesting thing about that because I had heard in 1992 at the when I finished the Malmö Symphony I ended up doing a two-week tour um in Japan with the Stockholm Philharmonic and the conductor was Gennady Rosiusvenski who's one of picture, my favorite conductors and a, yeah he was great he was my a friend just, of mine amazing really yeah, oh, yeah, I got to do Shostakovich with him, the piano concerto. He used uh -huh. to come to Zurich and I used to hang out with him and his wife. I did the Shostakovich concerto with his wife a few times in different places. Oh, wow. I, Gennady is 
one of my very all-time favorite conductors. Yeah, well, he was great. And we, the uh, Ben Paulson played first on the Sibelius and I played first on the Tchaikovsky fifth. And, and he was just great. And my wife loved him. She said, when he'd walk on stage, you probably can remember this. It was like, he just sort of floated oh, on yeah. stage. And of course, amazing stick technique. But I, I, I never talked to him except just one time. And this was after there'd been some controversy about the, the book. And so he was coming off an elevator when I was getting on. And so I just asked him, about the book. And he said, well, a lot of the stories that are in the book, Shostakovich told me personally. So who knows? Actually, Volkov, you know, wrote, wrote another really, uh, I thought, fascinating book about Tchaikovsky and ballet right. with Balanchine. That's a really, really good book, too. Uh, it makes it makes me happy that we're talking about Gennady because I, I we when, when Gennady would come to Zurich, it was always a festival. I think we did... Um, we did some Prokofiev with him, but we did the Shostakovich 7 with him was amazing. And actually one of the, yeah, high point of my of my trumpet playing was doing the, the piano concerto with him conducting with Allah, mm -hmm. with Victoria Postakova playing piano. So I'm very happy that Gennady has come into this conversation. But yeah, he was great. He was really great. And my wife I, just loved him. Just we loved were him. talking about that you conduct that you used to compose used to compose at the piano. So back, back oh to yes, there. okay, yeah, right, right, okay, yeah. And I mean, occasionally, I mean, I've written some pieces or parts of pieces on trains and on buses and 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 things like that. Um, and now that I've started to engrave, uh, you know, with an engraving system, I'll occasionally when I'm engraving, I'll get an idea. I'll I'll still keep composing on, on the system, but I still do, I'd say most of my composing at the piano with a pencil. Okay, fantastic. Now, I've got one more topic that I wanna talk about, and it's kind of, I have to say thank you to you that these interviews are even happening. I've been trying to work out how I ended up doing this. And the, the path was, I, I wanted to start playing the trumpet again, then I thought, oh, I'll make a few videos to present myself as this born again trumpet player, born again trumpet teacher. And then I thought, oh, maybe I'll interview my, I'll interview my teachers. And then it grew and it grew. And I was trying to work out why. And then I realized that over the last year, I have been ingesting all of these different amazing podcasts. And yours is definitely one of them that I have oh, really you. enjoyed immensely, especially I think I love the one with Michael Sachs and I love the one with, um, with Joe Alessi and Chris Martin. So maybe as a parting thing, maybe talk about what, what got you into doing that? What was your, what was your impetus to do that? I'm, I'm very grateful. I love them. But how did you get to be doing that? Well, I never, I never, I mean, I listened to podcasts and I, I listened to a lot of Tim Ferriss podcasts and, and some non-musical podcasts were the ones that I would listen to. But then one day, my son, Jason, who's uh, now 25, and he lives uh, near Frankfurt, was visiting. And we were up at the computer. And I, I don't know if I played something for him on a podcast, you know, some quote that somebody said or what, but I remember we were at the computer and he said, you should do a podcast. And I said, come on, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he, he kept pushing me, you know, so I said, after a while, I said, well, okay, maybe that makes sense, you know, and and so finally I ended up doing it. And I had I knew it was going to be a lot of work. I didn't realize how much work it was going to be, but it was my son who basically sort of shamed me into to getting started on it. And so I, it, then I started reading about before I started doing the interview. Started reading about podcasts and how to do podcasts. And what a number of people say is when you start out, start in your niche. So for me, that would be brass playing trumpet playing specifically and then brass playing. But now I'm trying to um, to broaden out and eventually want to go into to other areas like you, but mine will be confined to music. But on, on, on Wednesday, I'm going to be interviewing Jan Swafford, who's a phenomenal music biographer. Um, and um, I just interviewed a, uh, an administrator, David Keene, who actually was a tuba player at the beginning. And he's been a dean and a chairman, uh, executive director at the Music Academy of the West. Um, and I, there's one person I'll interview in the future who's uh, very, really an expert on artificial intelligence. So I think that could be a really interesting interview. His son is, is a very fine young trumpet player. So we could explore you know, artificial intelligence and music together. Wonderful. So so we'll see where it goes. I mean, I'm certainly learning a lot. That's yeah. For sure. It's, well, I'm, I wonder whether you're having the same feeling as me. Like I get a lot out of the actual 
the doing of it, like our conversation now. But then when mm -hmm. I go back and watch it again, and because I, I, I'm just doing my, all on myself by myself, I put in the chapters, put in the timestamps, so I watch it oh, again. Okay. So I get to watch them before I release them. I get to watch them, you know, two or three times, and mm -hmm. I just I love it. And then what I really also am enjoying is people's reactions to it. And even though at the moment the audience is smaller and growing, but for example, when we talk about Ed and we talk about Mark and people, it brings up people's own stories about those same people. And the one right. that I did with, um, the one I did with Mick Mulcahy that just came out and we were talking about that's it. A great, that's a great interview. I heard the interview. It's a great interview. I, and I was prepared for your question about memorable concerts because you said, I always ask this. So I thought, okay. I've done my homework. That's why that's why you so quickly said I've got two and two. I was wondering <laughs> yeah, how you exactly. Had two. I was prepared. Oh, and I've, I've got a, I've got a new I've got a new question that I'm going to premiere with you right now for my last question. Okay. That's okay. been um that's been suggested to me by my dear friend Fabian who we're going to do a reciprocal interview of each other for the channel. Oh, okay. But what I really I really enjoying the interactions with people and for me because I'm just now starting to get back into music but also because of all the different things i've done so i'm really interested in introducing my musical audience to my things about autism or my autistic mm -hmm. friends to ideas about chinese medicine and this yeah. cross fertilization of ideas and it's just the fact that i have known and been influenced and inspired by so many amazing people that it's i'm getting a lot out of it but i feel like it's also um I think it's a beneficial document and yours definitely are no doubt now hmm. here it is premier let me course. ask you a quick question about Go. that though have you read um the the glass bead game by uh, hermann hesse i did many many years ago yeah you should read that i mean to me that's what you're talking about that everything is connected i need to read that you again know? i remember my wife uh she sort of poo pooed this idea until i explained it to her that i i could really see a connection between baseball and mozart in that at, at the beginning, you think it's very simple, but the more you get into it, the more subtlety uh, and sophistication there is in, in every sort of phrase. Yeah, I can see that for sure. Okay. So, anyway. I'm going to premiere. This is my first time asking this question. Should I be nervous? No, no, you don't need to be nervous. What music would you like to be performed at your funeral? Well, okay, I'll tell <laughs> I'll tell you, but you know, it's funny. You, you asked just the right question. I'll tell you a story about this. Um, my favorite trumpet player in the world is Alan Dean. I don't know if he's maybe not so well known. Of course, I know Alan, of course. Actually, I, and I did an interview with Alan and, and Ray Mace, who are both heroes of mine. Um, and Alan is really smart. He's extremely well read. And the thing I love about his playing is that it's when he plays, you never think that's a great player, even though he's a great player. You just think, what a great piece of music, you know? So it's all about the music. And so um, he sent, he sent uh, we, were, we were talking, chatting by email, and he sent this thing that he had gone up to Canada to visit his brother, who's a trumpet player. And his brother said, let's go to the church and we'll record this a couple of things. And so I think they did a couple of duets and there was a pianist there and, and he said, okay, you guys record Amazing Grace. And so they, I don't think they even rehearsed it. They just played through it. They just did three verses. And the second verse, Alan does um, like sort of a jazz take on it. And it's, it's just totally low key, subtle. And it just, I, I thought, wow, that's so great. And, and Kathy, my wife came home that night and Alan is responsible for my being married to Kathy because he and his wife his wife was a good friend of Kathy's and they set it up, set us up for a blind date. So we're, we're really close to Alan and his wife. And so I said to Kathy, I said, I want to play this for you. And then I want, I'm going to say something and I don't want you to be angry at me. And she said, okay. So I played it for her and I said, okay, now don't be angry at me. But if I die before Alan, I want him to play that at my funeral. And she said, you know, funny thing is, when I was listening to that, I was thinking I wanted him to play that at my funeral. Wow. So, yeah. Ah, yeah. And it's, it was just a low key, amazing grace thing. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that would be. You've said, let me actually, let me tell you, 
Let you've set you a very high time. benchmark. I'm gonna luckily I'm gonna be recording quite a few of these interviews before they're released, so people won't know in advance. But let me say yeah. that you have set a very high benchmark for being asked that question because you didn't you actually had a whole like a universe for that question to exist in before I even asked yeah. it. Well, let me, let me tell you another story. So I mentioned Alan and Ray that I interviewed both of them and they're both really great people and really great friends. And Ray and I, we all played with Summit Brass and Ray and I were sort of like extreme opposites on like on tours. I remember one time on the bus, we were going to the plane, catch a plane at the end of a tour and his socks, and this was like 30 years ago. Ray is such an elegant guy and his socks cost $18 and the suit that I was wearing that I got at a flea market cost $5. So, I mean, <laughs> I was unorganized, chaotic, and May Ray is just such an elegant, totally well put together person. And so we sort of have fun with that. And so we were on a bus and one of the horn players was talking about visiting St. Petersburg. And there, I guess there's this huge graveyard in St. Petersburg where Borodin is, is buried. And I guess they had this huge slab on, and on this huge slab is the melody bum ba -dee, da -dee, da 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 right? Yep. And how, how impressed he was by that. And Ray said, oh yeah, I can imagine when Tony's buried on his gravestone, it's going to be bop, 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 you know, the beginning of Animal Ditties. And of course, everybody laughed about that. So, so those are, those are two funeral stories for you. Very nice. And I just... Quickly to say, I met. Oh, let me let me just say, sorry to interview, sorry to stop stop you here. I mentioned that to Alan, and and he said, well, okay, if that happens, at least I'll have another gig. So <laughs> there you go. I was just going to quickly say that I met Ray a couple of times, but Ray's been a bit of a theme because two of my two people I've already interviewed, Olivier Turia and and Bolaj Nemish, oh. they both learned from Ray in at Juilliard. So right, you know, right, and very uh, yeah remarkably fine play and at the time I, I think I actually met him when I heard Summit Russ play in, in Germany once just a yeah elegant as a person and as a player just yeah completely yes yeah elegance I think that really describes Ray Tony I want to thank you immensely now the way my what mine work I really don't edit stuff so what we've done is what's going to come out and it's absolute gold and thank you so much for your time and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to say farewell to my audience.